welcome attendees coming in. Uh, Mike Romper Room, I see Nia and Ken and Jamie. Nia uh, is, uh, teaches dynamical systems and complex systems at Arizona State. Uh, she was my, uh, my professor when I was there. She was my mentor. So we got a whole series of mentors down the chain. All right. Uh, and we see Gary Nelson coming in and uh, has a relationship with Mo. Mo, it was at uh, Oberlin, and as was Gary as a music instructor. Welcome, Gary. And hello, Nick. And, and hello, Tom Greenbaum, the quintessential technologist, artist, scientist crossover. So we'll wait a couple of minutes so that more people can come in and then, then we'll start. Wait, how long have you been teaching at the New Mexico school? This was actually my second year. I just finished my second year there. It's a great facility. Yeah. The new, uh, the new building is really, is really a, a much improvement over the original building. Yeah. I haven't seen the new building. We have actual science labs now, which are very oh, nice. helpful <laughs> for teaching science. OK, why don't we start? Uh, I'd like to first talk about SciArt Santa Fe briefly. Uh, that's the organization that's hosting this laser. Uh, SciArt Santa Fe uh, works at the intersection of art and science, and we do public programming and educational initiatives. Uh, we are one of a small group of organizations around the world, including universities and nonprofits and other organizations, selected by Leonardo, the International Society for the Arts, Sciences, and Technology, uh, to host these laser talks. So they're held around the world. Uh, I'm going to go to the next slide here. So let's see if you can see that, hopefully. On the Leonardo website, leonardo.info, if you uh, search for lasers, you'll see a schedule of talks, and they're all art science integrated talks uh, of really great variety. Uh, so we have been hosting lasers for a while. Hopefully, we'll get back to doing in person lasers. Uh, generally with lasers, in-person lasers, people introduce themselves at the beginning and talk about what they're working on or what their interests are. So we encourage you to do that in chat, to introduce yourself and let us know where you're from and what you're working on, if you'd like to share that or what your affiliations are. It's always interesting for other people in the crowd to learn about each other. So um, I'm going to introduce Stephen. Uh, Stephen Guerin uh, has actually done lasers before with us. He, uh, he's the founder and CEO of SimTable, and that's an augmented reality and physical simulation system. Uh, he's also the president of Redfish Group, which is a complex adaptive systems consultancy in Santa Fe, New Mexico in the US. So he's directed over 50 projects in complex adaptive systems for national and international clients. And his work centers primarily on visualization, modeling, and the design of self-organizing systems. Uh, Stephen 
I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm going to uh, stop sharing and let you take over so you can introduce everyone and get started. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Amy, and thank you for organizing this. It's a great service to the art and science community. Um, I moved to Santa Fe in 2000, attracted to uh, you know, the region, you know, especially uh, Santa Fe Institute and some of the research coming out of Los Alamos Labs and Sandia in complexity and, and found uh, you know, a very rich conversations with art uh, and you know, I, I, me as a technologist, uh, kind of uh, uh, in between those two worlds um, or, or bridging them. Um, so, I, um, so I'm very um, excited to find the Leonardo and the uh, Balcotra and um, uh, the laser talks. And uh, maybe 15 years ago, I got very involved in the supercomputing challenge, mentoring high school students. In 2008, Moet was one of uh, was one of the, is a sixth grader coming into uh, Supercommitting Challenge and mentored him through uh, high school. So I'm very excited to keep, see him passing the torch down with his students. And I, just at a high level, I think uh, Northern New Mexico and in general, culturally, uh, we're making a transition to what you're gonna see the students working on with computational tools. So some of you are familiar with Brian Arthur and Yuri Lewolensky, the uh, author of NetLogo and Brian Arthur, kind of a founder of complexity economics. Both of them make the point that it took us 400 years to transition from a, a representation in mathematics from Roman numerals to Arabic numerals. So if you can imagine doing multiplication and division in uh, Roman numerals, how, how complicated that must have been. Uh, and then people, shopkeepers would do their work in Arabic numerals, but still have to show it to the state in Roman numerals. Well, I think we're just going through a similar transition right now in science and um, uh, moving from couple different a representation of couple differential equations, as you're as you're going to see people trying to model waves uh, in Feynman's day and even before, how do we do the you know the wave equations to this representation of computational algorithmic approaches and agent uh, one of the tools of agent based modeling that the students are very adept at now uh, that they'll be showing. So hopefully it won't take us 400 years to make that transition. Uh, maybe it's taking us maybe 40 or 50, uh, but it's kind of the, a, a language of science is going to uh, coming to the fore. So, uh, so I encourage you to, if you were, uh, you know, in college, if you remember how they talked about waves and how they represented them or how they represented light, but really, did you really have a way of uh, manipulating it? And uh, I really encourage you to watch um, what the students are doing. And um, so I'm introducing now Paige Prescott. Um, she is... Uh, bar, bar none, the, probably one of the, the best person with uh, community outreach and education, not only in New Mexico, but uh, nationally uh, as well. So I think she's done more than uh, just about anyone in bringing these new tools to students and organizing workshops. And uh, so, so Paige, I just want you, maybe if you can introduce a little bit about what the supercomputing challenge is and how people uh, might get involved and in, in, in your interest as well. Thanks, Paige. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Amy, thanks for having us. And, and Stephen, thanks for the introduction. And of course, your long history with Supercomputing Challenge. Um, so Supercomputing Challenge is a STEM competition. It has a 31 year history of working with students, primarily in the middle and high school age, age range, to um, get them working on projects of their own interest. Um, we promote team collaboration, and that um, students are choosing a topic at the beginning of the academic year. And they research, they learn coding, they have mentors like Steven in the community, and they really kind of uh, dive into that language of science and computer science in order to solve some problem that is of interest to them. And uh, I'll put in the chat a link there um, to our website and just, you know, we try and inspire, and inspire our students to really think and engage um, with rigorous uh, computational tools and, and research and to express themselves. Um, and the NMSA, NMSA team, as you'll hear, is just a, a fine example of students um, that pick a project, they work with a mentor, they also work with their teacher, sponsor, and they really um, 
uh, learn the communication and, and what's needed at, at a much more rigorous level than maybe they would get in a regular classroom. Um, so we're really happy to have um, our, these students uh, represent the supercomputing challenge. And uh, we would love to have any of you in the audience be involved as mentors, if possible. Um, and also want to shout out to a couple people that are in the audience um, that are also alumni or have um, worked with um, the teams as well. So if you are there and you know who you are, like David and Nicholas, please introduce yourselves and, um, and your connection to Supercomputing Challenge. And I'm gonna hold it, um, hand it off to uh, Mohit Dubey, who is not just an alumni and a sponsor, but just a really um, incredible person in the community. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paige and for all the work you do for all students across New Mexico and through the challenge, and also to Steven for that great introduction. You know, uh, I was once a student at NMSA and also once a member of the challenge, and it's been a privilege and an honor to come back and mentor this team of students for the past two years. And especially in such a challenging year when everything was online and, you know, Wi-Fi would go down and there were all kinds of things. We, they, they really showed me what it's all about when it comes to, you know, sticking to a research project and working through challenges and, you know, going through what, you know, trying to do something interesting at the intersection of art and science. So I thank you all for coming out here today and checking out their talk. And I hope you learn a lot. And without further ado, I think I'll pass it off to Rowan, who is going to start the presentation. Sounds good. Okay, so our presentation, we titled it Sign Language um, because we are both studying sine waves through the, you know, through waves and sound. And then we're also trying to communicate with those waves. So this seemed like a, a fitting name and it's kind of, it plays on the air of our interest in math. And an overview of our project is basically we are visualizing acoustics. And at the time that we were making this, we were really thinking about, you know, COVID-19 and how that plays a role with spatial signal processing. As Mr. Dubé already said, and others, we are from the New Mexico School for the Arts. Uh, my name is Rowan Janssens. Um, I'm Madeline Kingston. And I'm Brandon Morrison. And as you guys know, our mentors were Mohit Dubé and Stephen Guerin. Okay, uh, so as said before, we all come from the New Mexico School for the Arts and uh, Manny and I in particular, we are in the music department of our school. So we had an interest in sound and how sound works. And we kind of wanted to, at the beginning of this year, we wanted to uh, integrate our music into our project and see how we can use this project to help musicians alike uh, during COVID. Uh, so we were interested in the nature of sound waves, how they can be modeled and the applications of these models. And obviously COVID-19 has had a huge impact on everyone's life. And as musicians, many of us have been unable to perform together in person. So we saw the need for, to uh, contact trace the spread of COVID to ensure everyone's safety. So we created a sandbox wave model, which we nicknamed the wave box, where over the co course of our project, we could implement two applications for to remedy these problems. The first was a way of tracking COVID infections using a sonic proximity system that uses sound to track, track distance between two points. And the second was a spatial audio rendering system that shows how it would sound like if musicians were performing together in real life. So as Brandon explained, we started with creating this kind of overview model that we could use to then tackle these two applications. And to do that, we first did some research into the shallow water wave equations, which are a series of partial differential equations that can be used to model the amplitude of waves in a body of water, such as a bathtub or a lake. And we found that actually, although these equations are meant to model water, they are so general that they can be extended to model really any wave in general. And so we're modeling sound waves. And so this seemed like 
uh, the good equations to use. Now, this here is not the, so the partial differential equations, it's like three of them. And this expression you see on the screen is a combination of those expressions that provides us with a discrete way to kind of calculate the spread of these waves. Um, and we are going to be modeling our waves in a program called NetLogo. And NetLogo basically has all these different pixels on the screen, and then each pixel we can calculate different values for, basically. Um, and so this equation is perfectly tailored to do just that. So uh, we're going to think of first the water waves. We're going to move to the sound waves a little bit later. But here, you can think of the vertical velocity of the water molecules, I guess. Um, you know, the partial derivative of the y with respect to time, that we can calculate by summing over all of the current heights of all the neighboring pieces of water or pixels. Um, and then we subtract the number of neighboring pixels times their height. Um, so um, in this little example at the very bottom, we can see we've got one like pixel right in the center, and the neighbors are evenly spread out, which means that in this calculation, the vertical velocity is going to be zero. And this means that this pixel will not change uh, in the next tick, which is like the discrete time changes that we're using. On the other hand, in this example, both of the neighbors are higher in location. So this uh, patch or pixel is going to move up. So when we apply that in one dimensions, we get just a single wave moving down a length of, I guess this looks like rope. Um, and luckily, we can scale this up to two dimensions very easily. We really have to change not much at all. We just have more neighbors now. So here we've got only two neighbors, and now we're going to have four neighbors. And the same thing is happening. We're applying a sine wave to a single point in our plane, and then we're watching how those waves spread out from there. And you can see all the little pixels here um, that are continuously running that calculation that I previously showed to update what their new you know, velocity is, which is depicted by the, the shading of the, of the pixels. So to make our model even more realistic of what we're modeling, which is sound waves, we decided to move in that direction. Um, so we're no longer thinking of the height of the water waves. We're thinking of the pressure of the air uh, in a field. And we all know that sound waves are basically changes in pressure. And so instead of changes in you know, height with respect to time, it's changes in pressure with respect to time. Um, that's where this dp dt comes from. Uh, additionally, we added two variables to our equation that allows us to manipulate how the waves propagate. The first one is surface tension denoted with alpha. And this scales the the whole sum term that I previously showed on the screen. We've also got a sustain term denoted with beta. And that scales how much the change in pressure is added on to the old pressure. So just to get the terminology straight, I'm going to say every single tick, which is every single time step, we are going to add the new change in pressure to the old pressure to get the pressure for that tick. right? Um, and so Visually, the effects that surface tension and sustain have, surface tension affects how kind of thick the medium feels. Um, so when surface tension is really high, that might look like waves going through honey. Uh, and then if it's really low, that seems like the waves are very, they can move really quickly and they can kind of spread out really quickly. And then sustain affects how much those waves die off um, over time. So if sustain is really high, the waves bounce around for a really long time before they kind of dissipate. And then if sustain is really low, they kind of drown out really quickly. So now we wanted to kind of tune our model to match sound waves exactly in a physical sense. And our first idea to do this was to make our model match the inverse square law. And what we knew was that the inverse square law in free space was that basically from some source, the amplitude of any waves are going to decrease by one over the square, uh, yeah, one of the square of the radius from the source. So for example, here at a distance r, there's going to be some amplitude. And then here at 2r, there's going to be a quarter of the amplitude 
at this distance, which is twice as close. And with this knowledge, we came up with a way to score our model, um, where we basically take the absolute value of a quarter of the amplitude at some distance minus the amplitude at some distance that's twice as far away. So a score of 0 means that our model matches the inverse square law perfectly. And we've got these two variables that I previously mentioned, surface tension and sustain. And we can basically change these variables around. And we, we, we thought that some combination of these variables would be optimal for matching the inverse square law. Um, and I'll note here that in the end, it turned out that this was not a super well thought of idea. And it caused some trouble. But it was still an interesting way to examine our model and then test it. So yes, we did a parameter sweep, where basically we select a ton of different random variables um, for those two variables that I mentioned. And then we calculate that score. And so we did about 400 different combinations of these variables. And we plotted the results here. And we can see there's a very clear local minimum where we have determined this is the optimal value for the variable. Um, so this just shows the surface tension tuning right now. Um, and we can see that 98.5 is where it is lowest. And then here is the tuning for the sustain. And we can see that we get a minimum at 0 0.991. Um, and so we were pretty happy with these results. We thought, wow, OK, with these numbers, our model matches the inverse square law very well. And we can implement them. And then hopefully our model will be super realistic. And you know it models the real world with a high precision. Um, a little note, you'll see that the graph kind of changes direction. This inflection point is a result of the absolute value term that we incorporated in our scoring function. And so yeah, once we implemented those into the model, we found that we had a percentage error of less than a percent when it came to matching the inverse square law. And we thought that that was you know, quite good. Um, in this diagram, we've also, at this point, added two different objects in our model. The first one is a speaker, which can emit sound waves by basically changing the amplitude of the pressure of the field at some point. And then a speaker object, uh, which is the red circle here, which is able to basically uh, port out whatever the amplitude of the field is at that point. And we'll be using these for the rest of our experiments. On either side here, the two extremes of the testings are displayed. So here, the su surface tension is quite high, and the sustain is also very high. And you can see the waves don't really die out a lot. They were they started here, and here they seem to have almost the same amplitude. Uh, and then here, they are dying out more quickly. OK, uh, so now I'm going to talk about one of our applications of our wave box, the sonic proximity system. So we wanted to figure out a way that we could track COVID-19 spread during the pandemic. And we looked at different ways of doing this. First, we looked at GPS technology, but we found that it wouldn't work very well because of its poor accuracy with vertical height inside of a building and because of how it doesn't account for walls when tracking the dis distance between two people, which would cause false positives. Uh, instead, we decided to use ultrasonic waves because they move so slow enough for us to time them and measure them for distance and because they don't go through walls. Uh, and by timing how long it takes for sound to travel some distance with just millisecond precision, we can't expect to get an accuracy of plus or minus 34 centimeters, which we found was accurate, not accurate enough for this project. Uh, we use NetLogo to model our sonic proximity, proximity system. Uh, the picture on this slide shows kind of how it would work where the first phone would send an initial ping, and then the second phone would pick it up and then send a return ping. And the first phone receives that ping and uses the amount of time it took to calculate the distance. And in this next slide, you can see a video of how it works in NetLogo. And I might add, this is the wave box that we developed previously. Yes. We've implemented the uh, system. And this makes use of both the emitters and detectors uh, so to make the phones in Net logo. So they are both a speaker and a microphone. Uh, and we did get a number at the bottom. Uh, I don't know if you could see that, 
but uh, that was the measurement that we got that showed how many units were calculated for the distance. Yeah, it's going to pop up right at the very bottom. It's incredibly hard to see, but uh, yeah. <laughs> right there. Oh, my God. 477, 497. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And then after we had that functional model, we wanted to try and make a prototype for the uh, real life application of this in JavaScript. So we used a fast Fourier transform to detect the audio frequencies and use this equation to calculate the distance. And on this next slide, this is a uh, slide after this. <laughs> Yeah, this slide is the results that we got from the experiment. Uh, unfortunately, we had only an accuracy of plus or minus 5.7 meters, which isn't accurate enough for, to be very helpful, especially with this application. Because, uh, you know, with uh, COVID, you wanted a distance between two people of only two meters. So having plus or, fi plus or minus 5.7 was not helpful at all. Uh, but we found that we were limited by the web audio API, which wouldn't allow us to get the accuracy that we wanted. Thankfully, our model in NetLogo worked well. Uh, so we found that to be satisfactory enough to move on. Uh, and our idea wasn't super flawed as a group from Carnegie Mellon was able to create a similarly operating system that was successful in the app Novit, which you can see the logo at the bottom. Uh, so because of all of this, we wanted to move on to our next application of the Wavebox, which Maddie will talk about in the next slides. Yeah, so now that we have a proof of concept that this Wavebox that we created is a pretty accurate representation of how sound behaves in real space, one of the things that we were curious about is if this would work for spatial audio rendering, which basically means if you have two people who are playing music in, or something or speaking in the same room, then um, you're able to basically see how that room affects the way that they're, they sound. So for example, if you had two people playing um, in a bedroom, it would sound different than if it was in a concert hall. Um, so there are a couple of different um, reverbs as it's called in um, music production that kind of do this where they simulate the natural effects that a space has on sound waves. The first of these two is uh, convolution reverb, which is created based on an impulse response file or like a sharp sound, like a clap or a gunshot recorded in a space, um, which then that kind of pattern of reverberation can be combined with a sound file to um, kind of simulate as if that sound file was actually being played in the space itself. Um, the other option that's usually used is algorithmic reverb, which is a synthesized computer manipulation of the waveform of a sound, um, which is either, either used to imitate a space or form an imagined effect. So if any of you are familiar with music production, a really common example of this would be spring reverb. So these work as a shortcut for giving spatial effects, but they're not, and they're pretty efficient, uh, but they're not, they don't give a direct spatial simulation. Um, and tracks or recordings have to be panned or like placed in different places um, to give an illusion of space. So it's not quite as effective as a model space. Um, and additionally, we can't use these things in a space that doesn't exist. So there are a couple of reasons why there wouldn't be a space that exists is like video games or in movies where the set isn't like looks different on screen than what it actually is when filming. Um, or in this particular context during COVID when you can't actually perform in a space with someone else um, that you might want to emulate the effects of in a recording. So the way that we did this was we first created a sound file input. So the recording that we used was two notes being played on the violin, which was recorded as a dot wave file. Um, that dot wave file can be read with the NetLogo Python extension. Um, and then you can drive the wave amplitudes through NetLogo from a Python sound array. 
So once that um, WAV file has been like played into the net logo space through that uh, speaker object that we created, um, you can manipulate the net logo model space and parameters such as surface tension and sustain to change the way that the set the room in effect might actually change the way the sound is. Then you let the sound propagate in the wave box and we can record the output of that wave box effect using again the Python extension and um, the microphone object in NetLogo. So that recording is then saved as a new wave file, which we can listen to and um, analyze. So we did this process with a number of different renders of the same 3.5 second clip of two notes and a violin uh, with an 8,000 kilohertz or 8,000 hertz sample rate and analyzed the outputs. So the initial render was with the suspension or sorry, the surface tension and sustain variables optimized to match the inverse square law. So the surface tension is 98.5 and the sustain is 0.991. Um, and you'll see why we found that the inverse square law wasn't quite, didn't quite have the effect that we expected it to based on what the rendered output sounded like. I hope everyone was able to hear that. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. It was a little bit delayed with the labels, but you could tell the first recording was the raw input and the second recording was the output after the file had, or the after the sound file had been propagated in the NetLogo wave box and then recorded again. So as you could hear, the output was extremely distorted. It sounds like it was kind of underwater and almost all of the high frequency data, as you can see in the spectrogram is missing. So like, all of the yellow and green is an indication of sound that's been like captured in those wavelengths. So in the input, there's tons of overtones that go all the way up to 4,000 hertz. And in the output, there, anything above 500 hertz is cut off. So there's no sound up there, um, which kind of gives the effect of like sounding underwater because not none of the um, higher frequencies are actually traveling through. So it doesn't sound like a violin anymore. So we tried this again with a surface tension that was optimized based on just what we were hearing. So we found that when we were messing around with this, as the surface tension decreases, the cutoff in the data for higher frequencies that was around 500 Hertz um, rises to include more of the overton series. So based on those two recordings, you can tell they sound like they were played in different locations. Um, and if you look at the spectrogram, they all of the higher frequency data is still there, but they look slightly different. So there's no audible frequency like um, degradation and the presence of echo or reverberation accounts for the increased smoothness of the waveform, as well as like how long those green and yellow lines last in the spectrogram. So for the third render, we changed the sustain variable to optimize the sound quality and found that lower sustain added less reverb to the output or less echo and reverberation, um, making it resemble the original recording more closely, um, whereas a higher sustain meant that the sound propagated for a longer period of time and it sounded more echoey. So by coincidence, it's also common to have a sustain variable within like a digital audio workstation that's um, typically used for audio production um, to adjust the convolution or analytical reverb. So it was kind of cool for us to discover that um, our use of this similarly named variable um, exactly mirrors the acoustic effects or of increasing or decreasing the same variable in the digital audio workstation. <laughs> So at this point in time, we still didn't quite know why the variables we selected at the start 
um, that corresponded to the inverse square law did not translate to the effects of the space. Um, but in even with that, we were able to create a pretty effective um, reverb that could can be designed based on the, the way that the, the wave box is set up in that logo, which is pretty cool. So the way that we wanted to test out if this would work to set it up like an actual room was to um, place a sound impermeable barrier with a little gap on the side. I think you can see that's on the right side next to the wall um, and see how that would change that the recording of the sound. Um, so yeah. So it was really cool for us to hear that that does in fact sound like the difference between hearing a recording right next to you versus on the other side of a wall. Um, and that has a lot to do with the fact that almost all of the higher frequencies are cut off. So it sounds very muffled and you're just hearing the lower frequencies. Um, and then later we were able to like dig deeper into why exactly this is happening. So when the next thing that we tried was trying to figure out how to get stereo output in this model, because one of the things with um, convolution algorithmic reverb is that has to be done um, kind of, as you could say, more artificially or um, less directly correlated to where things are actually placed um, and more of an approximation. So the benefit of having this model means that you can actually place two instruments of performers in different places in a space and potentially record that differently. Um, <clears throat> so you end up with a stereo output rather than just um, uh, mono output. So the way that we did this was having microphone separation in a way that kind of resembles a Jekyll disc, which is a commonly used recording device to try to capture stereo. Um, and this creates a binaural recording. Uh, and here's just a video of kind of what's happening. Um, so we have a system where we can load in different audio tracks one by one, and then we can place those tracks in different spaces. Um, and then once we're all done, we can start playing all of those sounds. And you can see we get a separation of the audio signals in the left and right track. Let's see here. Um, so then ideally the output of um, that recording that you just kind of saw being set up, you'll be able to tell which direction each of those individual performers or individual tracks is coming from. So we actually enlisted some help from our friends in the vocal department at New Mexico School for the Arts, um, and they had sung a duet. And we put each of the input tracks on either side of this stereo microphone and recorded the output. So hopefully this will come through in Zoom, but you should be able to hear one singer on one side of you and the other singer on the other side of you. A whole new world, whole new world. That's, where we'll be. that's where we'll be, a thrilling chase, a thrilling chase. for you and me. Yeah, so it's kind of cool that we were able to get that to work in the model. And it's as if those two performers are actually in the same room as you, which is very cool. I'm actually, um, I'm going to quickly put the link in the chat. And you should be able, in, in case you weren't able to hear the stereo separation, this drive link, you should be able to play it on your local device. And with headphones, you'll definitely be able to hear the separation. Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to quickly talk about this slide. So this kind of combines the work we've done in both of our two applications of our model, and that is to calculate how big the modeled space actually is. And we can do that kind of using the, the proximity system that I had, that we worked on previously. 
and we can calculate how long it takes for some waves to travel some distance in the model. And then we can run the calculations to figure out that one patch is equal to 6.4 centimeters, or one pixel. Um, and unfortunately, this number changes with the surface tension specifically. So if we change the surface tension, it actually changes how big the model is, which is kind of surprising. Um, but what's interesting is with our 100 by 100 grid, which is what all of those simulations were run on, or most of them, that correlates to about 6.4 meters, which is just about the right size of a bedroom or maybe like a small pop-up stage that someone might create a performance on. So it's cool to kind of have an idea of how big this space really is. So in the future, we had hoped that we would be able to get a deeper understanding of our model behavior, which I think that we actually have a little bit more information to share with you all about that. Um, and some of the, and also like trying to see different variables for sustained and surface tension than the inverse square law. We also wanted to be able to have movable performers and listeners. So that means that like, what would someone hear if they were walking down a hallway with musicians in neighboring rooms? So this would be really useful um, to render sound in virtual reality or video games. Um, we also wanted to add a third dimension, which I think would have made that inverse square law apply a little bit more um, as it's not designed for two dimensions. And that third dimension would um, make everything seem a little bit more realistic as we do live in a three dimensional world. Um, additionally, in NetLogo, there's a way to import a modeled space from a drawing. So if you took out a piece of paper and drew like walls and some obstacles and then put that picture into NetLogo, it would be able to um, recreate that space with obstacles, which would be a cool way to explore how different musicians in different places would sound um, in different types of rooms. Um, and additionally, eventually we want to be able to upload this um, as an agent script so that there's faster processing and also it's more easily accessible for people to mess around with. And I might add like right now it takes on the order of several minutes to render a second of audio with this system. So a significant work needs to be done to make it, I guess, faster because right now it's, it's really impractical to use, um, yeah, even like that 24 second render that we showed you took so long to render that it was, it was quite ridiculous. <laughs> Um, yes, special thanks to our two singers that you heard. Got some references. And now it's time for questions. Let's see if I can open the chat. Um, actually, maybe I'll have to just stop sharing. Yeah, no, there are some questions in chat. I just asked one, but I know that there was one earlier on. Let me go up and find it. What are the best practices to train artists in computational thinking, logic, and programming? That was from Nico Silva. And I'm opening it up to everyone, Paige, Mohit, Steven, and students. Steven put some um, good resources in the chat there. I don't know if that was in response to that particular question, but. I think I can kind of add on to what Steven wrote. Um, I would say like in terms of thinking like a computer programmer, I would recommend Python because I feel like it's such a simple language. I, in fact, I felt like Python was simpler to understand than NetLogo, which is what our programs were working with. However, uh, your question also mentioned art, and I feel like you probably want a visual output <laughs> at that point, and I feel like that would make NetLogo the most easy way to get a visual output from whatever you're doing. Uh, Python would have the added step of using some sort of plugin to you know, paint whatever you're calculating on the screen, uh, which, which would add some complication. Um, we also wanted to show you, I guess, Maybe this is now a good point to talk about some of our late realizations that we came across, which is that, yeah, as we kind of hinted at, the idea to use the inverse square law was somewhat nearsighted and not fully thought out. 
as an idea. And that's because the inverse square law doesn't uh, really work so good in two dimensions. And it's really like hardly a three dimensional phenomenon. So it was, it was kind of presumptuous to try to get that to work in two dimensions. And we should have done more research. And then we could have realized that that was not such a great idea to attempt that. Um, and that I think might I also, add that also it's, it's still useful that we did do that research, though, because it means that when we do actually take this model into three dimensions, we'll have a super easy way um, to make sure that that's like scaled correctly um, and that everything is still functioning as if it was a real real room. So, yes. Yes. Um, and then the other thing that we thought was interesting is that we thought we'd go into more detail into why we think that the wall obstacles were so effective at reducing the higher frequencies. And that comes into diffraction. Let's see if I can. Um, so here we've got a little video that's kind of that someone else has made that kind of explains diffraction. And I think that this is exactly what our model has been able to recreate. Uh, let me quickly do some settings. There we go. The next thing I want to look at is so I'm just going to skip forward a little bit. Basically, there are, is like an aperture, and then and if you now the, look at the screen, there's like some waves being generated waves that through the aperture, go through. They spread out. This spreading out of a wave as it passes through an aperture is known as diffraction, and it's a property of all types of waves. So what do you think controls how much the wave spreads out? Well, one possibility is the width of the aperture. And what do you think would happen if I made the aperture smaller? Well, you might be surprised to learn that a narrower aperture leads to more spreading out of the wave, more diffraction. If instead I make the aperture wider, then after it's settled down, you can see that the wave becomes less spread out. The diffraction is less pronounced. I don't know if Rowan froze there for a minute, but um, basically the idea of this is that it's kind of surprising that you there would be more of a effect on like how much diffraction or waves there are on the other side of like a small gap than there is in a larger gap, which is kind of interesting because um, when we had that wall up in one of our models or one of the renders that we did, it sounded like it was on the other side of a wall. Um, and this, uh, because the barrier was impermeable, it wasn't because only the lower frequencies are passing through it, um, but it was instead because um, of that particular phenomenon. So it meant that um, the uh, lower frequencies um, were, were kind of expanded upon and uh, the higher frequencies were not. So this kind of, um, I wonder if I can share my screen. There's a little bit, a couple other slides that we have that kind of explain this. I can also, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I- Okay, uh, you're back. Yeah, let me see here. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know which slide would you like me to show? Uh, I think you should go back too. I think that- um, right, This one? Yeah, kind of just to go over. Okay. So the, smaller the the width of that um, aperture or little gap in the the wall is um, the higher levels of diffraction there are so it, this also means that um, larger wavelengths have high levels of diffraction whereas smaller wavelengths have smaller levels of diffraction um, so I think there's more on the next slide too yeah, so this is what we saw in our model. 
um, because all of the low frequencies were diffracted, which means that they were able to reach the microphone with greater ease because they were able to kind of pass around the corner. All the high frequencies were not diffracted really. And they were kind of, they just passed through straight, which means that they had a more difficult time bouncing around to the microphone, which is on the other side of the wall. And that's why the higher frequencies were quieter slash non-existent while the lower frequencies were the most predominant ones. So had we changed how large that gap in our wall was, there would have been um, a huge difference in where that frequency cutoff was in the spectrogram. So something that we might want to do in the future is try to test that out and see how, um, if they, like what the correlation between the actual size of the gap in the wall as and the, um, sorry, the size of the gap in the wall and like how much of the frequencies are actually cut off from this process of diffraction. Yeah, and I'll just um, add as a mentor, uh, that's one of the ex great experiences I, I learned on this as well, right? I, I When I watched uh, them getting this acoustic effect, I didn't really immediately connect it to light diffraction. And, you know, there's also some uh, artists here that are some really world-class holographers and who live and breathe diffraction of light. But, and so if you think of all the frequencies that are in their acoustic signal, and, and the higher frequencies not diffracting and the lower ones, you know, it's very similar to what you guys are doing with, uh, with your holograms. So I think it's, for me, I learned a lot. So I think that's always, that's, that's always an exciting thing when you can uh, participate. Um, so I see a question from uh, Nia. And Nia, I unmuted you. If you wanna ask your question directly. Sure. First of all, I'm just so impressed by this work. I cannot believe that I'm listening to uh, students who are not already advanced in college. And, and so I want to thank you for the invitation to come and, and listen to this. Um, and so I have a question. Um, as uh, So I do uh, dynamical systems modeling and um, there's some, and I do applications from one area of science to others. And so my question is, um, there are some elements of an existing model that can be changed without altering the integrity of the model and others that cannot, others that will fundamentally change what the model does. And I was really impressed how you took models from one area and adapted it to your question. So my, my question is, how do you adapt models from other areas for your application while, in, while retaining their functionality? What did you learn about that during this project? I think that actually we didn't know much about this at the beginning of this project. And therefore there are a couple of elements that are in there such as the inverse square law that we tried to adapt from other areas that turns out that they don't really adapt well and don't retain their functionality. So um, I think that by the end of it, we're kind of more aware of um, how that doesn't always work and how it's important to kind of have a pretty good understanding of what you're actually using so that you don't try to apply it to some other application that might not work. So like the one dimension to two dimension to three dimensional um, wave equation that we used um, or the model wave model equation, uh, retains its functionality really well between those dimensions. Um, and I think that as we learned more and more about the equation, it made more sense why that was the case. Whereas something like the inverse square law didn't really work in two dimensions, so. That's fantastic. And I think you're, you're right. As you um, learn more about uh, what you're studying, then you have more of an intuition, but it's nice to also be able to art articulate why. So what are, what is your understanding now about universals that are out there and other things that, that change as a function of um, the substrate or the content area that you're working with, you know? I'm not sure that there was a question, but I, I think uh, I you, you gave a great answer, but yeah, what having, so at first it's sort of trial and error. Some things work and some things don't, but as you become more accustomed to modeling and to also uh, better acquainted with your question and your content area, 
have you extracted out some higher order understanding of what can be adapted and what can't? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, you can answer. I was just going to say that I think what we learned is that the math can pretty consistently be applied to anything, but you need to understand it really well. And that's kind of where we fell short with the inverse square law is that we didn't understand the math behind the inverse square law when we jumped right into applying it to two dimensions. And I think if we had known the math right off the bat, we would have realized like, this is not right. We got to use a different equation for the inverse square law. And we would have realized like, it's not even inverse square, it's linear. Um, so I feel like, yeah, we can, I think we can learn the takeaway here is that like, you can always apply the math if you understand it well, but some of the other concepts are a little more uh, specific to each individual case. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great answer. And uh, I just encourage you all to keep going. This is fantastic work. And I, I also, I also study team coordination and I liked the teamwork inherent in this project that was so obvious in today's presentation and also in the answer to my question. So keep going. And, and if I can ever do anything to help out, let me know. Go Sun Devils. Go Sun Devils. Uh, uh, so uh, we also have, uh, oh, uh, Andrea Poli had a, a question, but uh, she doesn't have a good uh, soundscape right now. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and read the question then, is what she said in the chat. Um, so Andrea's question is, um, Andrea is a professor of art and engineering at uh, UNM. Also, I'll uh, point in that she was also out of New York, uh, a lot of the uh, great artwork and did great LA uh, stuff in Pittsburgh. Uh, um, so she, she, she writes, this research has interesting potential for influencing composers and sound artists. What ideas do you have about how an artist like yourselves uh, might use what you learned in creating compositions and other sound works or visual artworks? Um, yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, so starting out with this project, we didn't even like think about how like an artist could use uh, this project in terms of like using it for compositions and sound books. Uh, we started out just thinking of like musicians in uh, COVID and uh, quarantine, how we couldn't uh, perform together in person. And so uh, I think as it went on and we created that spatial audio rendering system, we figured out that we could actually use that system in a multitude of different ways. Like as Maddie said earlier in our presentation, uh, it could be used for like video games or movies where uh, soundscapes don't actually exist already in the real world. Uh, real world. I can't say that word, <laughs> but um, uh, as a composer myself, I, I do a lot of music composition. I actually see a lot of inspiration for how a music composer or any other type of like artist could use uh, this project as a means of in their as a means of their art and using it to, uh, to create like compositions. Yeah, I think that if we were able to get this whole model to run a lot faster and then perhaps put it on some website, I'd say it is really fine to just mess around with. Uh, you, can, you can just like put all your instruments in different places. You can record yourself saying things and like put echo onto it. Um, you can also just take videos. You can like record out the entire render, which you saw in the previous video, you can like see the waves basically. Um, so I think that that would be a really great place to start for both musicians and visual artists. Um, I'll show you some like cool things you can get like on the on the left here we've got this like really interesting checkerboard pattern that just comes from these standing waves that can kind of accumulate in the model and you can of course do inverse uh, sorry double split experiments and all sorts of other you get all sorts of really cool patterns uh, working with the with the system. Yeah, if we can get the processing speed up on this application, I can think of so many things that would be so fun to try with it. Um, so yeah. Um, if you're in the, in the chat and you want to ask a question, we can unmute you. If you're in the chat, just um, um, mention it. I didn't see where the, or raise your hand. Uh, that would be another um if you if you know how to do that 
I have a question about NMSA and um, and your knowledge in this area. And is this, were you studying this at an NMSA or did this come through Supercomputing Challenge and other sources? Most of your knowledge about this. This definitely came through the Supercomputing Challenge. I don't think we would have learned much of this if it wasn't for participating in the challenge. Well, but on the computing side, definitely. But I think that um, most of my knowledge of like um, music production and reverb and all of these things that we're comparing it to is directly from my um, the modern composition and theory class or contemporary composition and theory class that um, upperclassmen take at NMSA in the music department. Um, so a lot of my, or at least my ability to understand how this model can apply to um, like real things that musicians have to do uh, comes from the classes at NMSA. So it's definitely a combination of the two. Uh, yeah, so Anna writes um, wonderful work and I, I refer to, uh, to Anna uh, in uh, holography as well as Fred Untersher who's in here as well. Um, so their question, uh, their question is, have you considered combining a sound rendition with a visual rendition as the diffraction diagram you showed a few slides ago as a demo for how pinhole photos work? Combining the visual along with the sounds parallel could be interesting. Um, yeah, we've done a little bit of work to do this. Um, so in the NetLogo environment, there's a way to record every single frame of the simulation as a video. Um, of course, in our output renders that we've showed you, we have had so many different, like the sample rate is so high that it's infeasible to record every single frame. So we've done, you know, every like 300th or something. Um, but yeah, I think that if you're looking at really small, slow, slowed down scenarios, it could be really cool to see frame by frame a video of how it works. And you can definitely see that with the model, like you don't even need to record it as a video, you can just open up the model and experiment with some things and you can see it happening live on the screen. And you can see like the diffraction and everything. Uh, Moet, any uh, comments? Interestingly, on the pinhole camera note, actually Rowan and I experimented with building little pinhole cameras out of uh, cans and trying to make cyanotypes over them, out of them. We put them up before COVID and we just looked at them after COVID to see if we could get something and we actually did get a little. So we did experiment on another side experiment. We did look at uh, that same idea. And and Paige, any any thoughts? Well, it's just um really nice to hear the team go even deeper into their project because they were constrained um, back in April with just 20, 25 minutes and this they had a lot more to share and it's nice to have the opportunity to have a different audience as well. Um, and so we really appreciate that uh, Amy, you gave us this opportunity to um, have this team showcase their excellent work. So thanks everyone. I'll just kind of yeah. mention here in Santa Fe is, uh, you know, it's a place with science, tech, and art coming together, kind of following on Anna's question, uh, you know, with currents coming up in the rail yard where projection of art and sound uh, is playing. Uh, now that we're getting a little bit unmasked, I look forward to seeing people in person there. And to the students, uh, please come out to Currents and meet some of the people that are online here in person. Uh, and uh, they they can recognize your face, so they'll come and they'll come and find you. How's that? <laughs> so I and, and I'll just say uh, I'm just very impressed with the with you with you three. Yeah, this is our second year together, and. Um, uh, I, I was at your level when I was 42. <laughs> uh, so I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the generation. As crazy as things are sometimes in this last couple of years, it uh, gives me a lot of uh, hope for the future, watching you guys work. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you.
And, and thanks again, Amy, for organizing this. And with that. Thank you so much. It was fascinating. And we, uh, we recorded this and we'll be placing this online, right, Amy? So yes. people can uh, forward that to friends or watch other bits of it. Yes. Uh, okay. Fred is asking another question. Okay, uh, if you could read that, go ahead. Uh, Fred is asking uh, if there might be a way to get some holographers with this group. I'm not sure exactly, Fred, you might want to clarify. Um, Anna and Fred, let's, Anna, do you want to ask? I'm going to have enable you. You can ask verbally, it makes it easier. You hear me, Amy? Yes. Okay, God, sorry. We're having some technical and I'm trying to type as Fred's talking to me, so it's, I'm not good at it. <laughs> so Fred, why don't you state what you were thinking? And, you know, so, so much of the math and so much of the background of diffractions and interference and all this stuff is basically essential to holography, like Stephen said. And I would just see that there's a way or somehow we can begin to, to look at those What's going on with that is and find ways to come out with something that's either integrated or something together. I think you're saying like meet up some holographers with this group of kids and, and have more dialogue with Steve's group. Yeah, so Nia um, mentioned universalities and as, a, as her student back in the 90s, um, so things like phase transitions, whether you're studying a forest fire model or epidemic, you know, they have the same kind of universalities. Um, I think this what the students are studying with waves have that same kind of universality with, and as Fred is on our pointing out, right? So what you study in water, uh, with acoustic, you know, as, as Rowan and uh, the team kind of showed, well, we're not talking about surface height, we're talking about pressure and rarefication and compression instead of um, altitude being high and low. And I put in the, the chat, um, for me, just as, uh, as I've been kind of thinking about this and just learning more myself and Max Planck being the founder of uh, quantum mechanics and dealing basically with the waves as well. Um, I'll just read this if you don't mind. You know, if you, and you just go on to Wikipedia and uh, uh, and his views. But in '44, he said, "As a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you, as a result of my research about atoms, as much there is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particle of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together." We must assume behind this force, the existence of a conscious and intelligent spirit. This spirit is the matrix of all matter. Mm -hmm. so, I th so I think yep. it's, you know, waves, you know, it's just in, in my generation, we didn't have the way to study waves like the students are, you know, like computationally, mm -hmm. uh, or at least uh, uh, with the ease. So, um, so, with, so that, yeah. with that, that would be, my, and Fred, anything else to add to that? or related? Essentially, yes, that's one of the things that I've always said here about, uh, um, it just is my piece, is, is, you know, I feel that it's so important for people to be able to have a greater understanding about what's going on in the world around them so they can better add to or participate in their art. And, and uh, I've always felt, uh, oh, well, I'm tired of, of dumb art. I guess, and I'm I'm anxious to see if there are ways to make more careful integrations to say something other than it's a blue tree. I guess that's where I'm coming from, and see, I see these openings with these kids as the ability to move into those directions, and and I'm interested in furthering that and, and looking at that further. That's just where I'm coming from, you know what I mean? That's and, that's. Yeah. yeah, and it's just that, that, you know, it means so much more if you can have a deeper, greater understanding of the world around you that you're participating in that you can then contribute 
to, to many different ways. Does that yeah, thank sound you. Yeah, that's it. That sounds, thank you, Fred. And I, I shared a link to your uh, your site, Fred, to the for the students. And you know, so I think in the way you guys were exploring sound waves, you know, Fred and Anna and others in town uh, really are deep deep explorers of the light. So, um, and I encourage you to go see it. Currents, so they'll they'll have some pieces there too. So, and, and reach I, out to them. Yeah. What I this is Anna. What I might add about the wave is it's so primal. And so the more it can be explored in different senses, like sound, sight, et cetera, the deeper the understanding of what's really going on, because it's very primal. That's right. And so fun, I mean, and very fun, like we think now particles are emergent from the waves, right? And, yeah. and the waves, um, and, and, to, and to have a wave perspective um, is, is, is naturally a connected perspective. A particle is necessary uh, by its mm -hmm. definition isolated and in, in, in identity by itself, right? So well, here's one that, that I, I pull out all the time is the idea that we think we see objects, but we don't ever see objects. We see light, but we only see light in relationship to itself. So does that mean that light is only here half the time? Does that mean our visual world is here half the time? You know, that's 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 kind of where I come from. Thank you, Fred. And if there's any other last questions or comments, and Amy, I'll let you kind of close this out too. Yeah, thanks to all of you. That was fantastic. So we will get a recording up and share the link with you. It'll be on our YouTube channel. And if you want to use this or grab this for anything, let us know. Uh, but it was just a really great presentation. I'm really impressed with all of you. So, Stephen, is that a picture? You're not in a Kiva somewhere, are you? <laughs> it's, it's an undisclosed location. <laughs> that, oh, okay. That was what I was wondering. Okay. All right. If there's nothing else, and, uh, then I'm going to. Uh, one last announcement from Andrea. Uh, another laser coming up June 24th. Yes. Uh, SciSantaFe.org. And congratulations to the team. Yep. What's it going to be? Uh, it's the second one of our in place lasers. And it's with Chrissy Orr and Joanna Keen Lopez on uh, land arts. Uh -huh. All right. So you'll be getting, if you're on the Sciot Santa Fe list, you'll be getting a, a mailing about that soon. So uh, yeah, we'll have chat too. If, if students would like chat, we can um, save that for you too, so. Okay, uh, I'm going to finish the event and close it out. And unless any of you have anything else, you guys said, thank you so much. It was brilliant. You guys are brilliant. <laughs> I wonder how many people are on. You guys are propagating waves. <laughs> yes. Wave, wave goodbye. <laughs>